Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Well, if you've got your Bible with you, would you turn with me to the book of Galatians? And we're going to go to Galatians and chapter number three this morning. Father, as we come before you this morning, we just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather together. We want to thank you, Lord, that we're not here alone because we've got each other, but most importantly, we've got you because you are here present through the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, right now that you would open our hearts to receive of you this morning, that that which you have for us this morning, I pray it would penetrate even the hardest of hearts this morning. Lord, Teach us and train us, mold us into that which you always intended us to be. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would come now and change and transform lives here this morning, Lord. May the words that come out of my lips be words that are directly from the throne room and nothing else we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Galatians 3 uh, and verse 23 we're going to start in. Um, Some of these scriptures will come up uh, on the screen behind me. There we go. Perfect. Fantastic. Uh, We're going to cut in at verse 23 here. Um, This morning, just a word, those of you that came for an expository word this morning, it's not an expository word this morning. I'm sorry uh, about that if that's what you're looking for. I believe that God has given a specific word uh, for uh, various people here this morning, uh, which will be um, unraveled and unveiled as we go. We're going to be looking at scriptures here and we're going to be seeing what is it that exactly the scripture says but we're not going to be looking at details so oh, well, what was the original Greek there and what does that mean um, so we're looking at themes here today rather than uh, exposition of, of the scripture but we're going to read here starting in uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23 and it says now before faith came we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise." Going into chapter 4, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons." And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at the nature of fatherhood and inheritance. I I was been doing a little bit of a reading of Galatians. I've not got as far as chapter 5 yet. So basically what I'm preaching on here this morning is where where I've got to in Galatians. Uh, And for those of you familiar with Galatians, it's one of Paul's letters to the church at Galatia, uh, to the Galatian people. Um, And it talks a lot about life in Christ, about what does it mean to actually live as a follower of Christ. And it talks here a lot about that, that old thing gone, that we were slaves to sin before, and it's, and it's gone, and it's in the past. So what does that actually mean now, and how does that transform us? How should it transform our thinking? And that's what we want to look at this morning. When we go forward into the rest of chapter 4 and into chapter 5, it talks about life in the Spirit, living according uh, to the Spirit. And that's where we see those wonderful uh, lists of the gifts of the Spirit, of, of love, joy, peace, kindness, and so on and so forth. Uh, We're going to look here this morning at perhaps some blockages uh, to fatherhood and inheritance uh, and and also how to access it. What does it look like in the natural realm? What does it look like in the spiritual realm? I've given this morning's uh, message a title of how to gain the father's love. 
you know, you sort of see that, how to gain the Father's love, three quick steps to gain the Father's love, is actually a bit of a trick uh, title, a bit of a trick question, because the simple fact from the offset here is you cannot gain the Father's love. You cannot gain the Father's love because the Father simply loves us. He simply loves us. The real, but the reality is that even though God loves us, many have rejected his love. And let's unpack that a little bit. It would be a simple sermon if that was the case. There we go, fantastic, three minutes, shortest sermon ever, and we can all go and grab a quick cup of tea and be home for an early lunch. But we need to understand why so many cannot or will not fully accept the Father God's love for us in all its fullness. And I believe today that God wants to deal with some broken hearts. He wants to, to, to deal with things that have held us back. He wants to announce a renouncement of the spirit of rejection and announce the acceptance of Father God's love for you. You see, right from the start of the Bible, right from the start of creation, God is Father. He is our Father God. We see that in Isaiah 64 and verse 8. And we'll go there, Paul, if you can stick that scripture up. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. And it says here, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems fairly conclusive to me. I don't think we need to be establishing a public inquiry and various subcommittees to work out whether God is Father based on that verse there. Well, then let's go to 1 Corinthians and 8, 6. It says that we are unique because all creation flows from him. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So we exist through him this Father God. And then we go to Ephesians 4 and 6, says that, that really God is above and over all. One God and Father, there's that word again, of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's fairly encapsulating, isn't it? It's fairly all including there. We like that word in society these days, don't we? Inclusive. You, did you know that? God is the, one of the most exclusive things that you can ever come across, yet he's utterly inclusive at the same time. What does that mean, Stuart? He's exclusive of sin and he's inclusive of everyone that will come to him. Amen. What an amazing situation. We call God, of course, most well-known Father God in prayer, don't we? We say, Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's how we start the Lord's Prayer, as, as, as it says in the Gospel of Matthew there. And Jesus taught them to pray in this way, our Father. So if Jesus, who is the Son of God, teaches us to pray in a certain way, saying, call him Father, then he must be our Father. And in Genesis 1.26, we see that God shows his love for us in even creating us in his image uniquely. Did you know that you created in the image of God? And did you know that when you're walking around, what that means is that people should see a reflection of God in you, in your face. Would remarkable, really, isn't it? I, I, I regularly don't really feel worthy of that. But yet, he still created me uniquely in his image. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And just as Father God is unique, fathers here on earth, our earthly fathers, our natural fleshly fathers, have a unique, a special role. So we're unique people created in God's image, but also our fathers have a unique role. It's a God-ordained role. And because of this, the devil attacks the role of fathers. Oh, we live now, sadly, in a society where, where fathers and the role of fatherhood has been marginalized. It's been deliberately relegated and pushed aside. We see the growth as a result of broken families. And it's a problem that is growing. Things are simply getting worse, and we see the results out in society. Some stats to put things in proportion for you. In 2013, the BBC reported that there was one million children growing up in the UK in a broken house. In 2022, the Office for National Statistics estimated that 2.9 million households were fatherless. That's almost a tripling in nine years. 
a tripling of nine years. What does that mean in reality? It means that one in five children are growing up without a father. The UK has the highest rate of family breakdown in all of Europe. In all of Europe. We are, folks, fundamentally a broken nation made up of fundamentally broken people. And the result, we're raising a generation of children who are fundamentally broken from the get-go. Mental health and behavioral disorders all the way through the roof. Did you know girls learn how to find that partner, how to find that husband who look, through looking at how their father treats their mother? Boys learn how to treat women by looking at how their father treats their mother. In short, it's very hard for children to grow up into what they really should be without the constant presence of a decent father. There's no coincidence, I think, that the result that we see out in society that sexual abuse and harassment has risen exponentially at a time of same time as fathers being more and more absent. So why has this happened? Well, as we already said, the devil will attack fathers. It's a spiritual attack on families. Why? Because they are the root of society. Those of you that were out in Glasgow or even Edinburgh this week um, at the um, Awake Arise will have heard Andrea say this phrase that they have in Korea where they, say, um, where they say, healthy families, happy nation. You see, if your family is healthy and the next family is healthy and the next family is healthy after that, then it will help to promote a happy nation. It's really quite simple. So I ask here now, hypothetically, can we uh, say that we are a happy nation? If strong families bring a happy nation and we're saying that actually we have a massive issue here with millions of weak and broken families, are we, can we be a happy nation in our current state? You see, God created three seats of government. Three seats of government. We find this at various points in the Bible. We're not going to go into great detail here, but basically these three seats of government are the family, the church, and the state. He created all three to have particular responsibilities in each area that they're given responsibility for. And it's fine and it's great when those areas and those seats of government take those responsibilities seriously and enact on them on a continual basis. However, when one steps over the line, or in the case of families, if one abdicates its responsibility, it creates and it leaves a gap it creates a vacuum and you know what happens in a vacuum the devil jumps right in and the devil has attacked families because strong families make a strong community and strong communities coming together make a strong society and a strong society makes a strong nation and a strong nation which is also then going to be a good nation that stands for godly values is a nation that's going to push back against the tide of evil elsewhere in the world but without fathers taking up responsibilities, it leaves a gap. And so we find, what do we find? We find the state steps in. And they do a bad job of it, generally, because it's not their job. It's not naturally their role. So they're trying to do something which they're not meant to be doing. They're overstepping their mark. They're entering in. So we start to see in the schools that the state says, well, we're going to deliver sex education because we've got a problem with teenagers sleeping around all over the place. So we're going to deliver sex education and we're going to make teenagers even more aware of these things so that that will make them not do it. I, 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 totally flawless logic, absolutely, of course. Well, what do we find? We find sleeping around, we find teenage pregnancy. The numbers just keep going up and up. The more and more you talk about these things, the more and more you encourage young people, the more and more they will be inquisitive and start to want to engage in such things. So the state doesn't do a good job of it. If the parents are there, if the family unit is talking about such things in a healthy setting, well, children are going to learn about how relationships work if their parents have got a good relationship. And God placed... The father, the mayor, what the head of every household. You might not like that. That may make you feel uncomfortable. I can tell you, I've got many, many friends who are fathers, and they do not like having the responsibility of being head of the house. This is not about a patriarchy. This is not about control. This is about a responsibility that God has ordained. And our job is to walk in that responsibility. And when we do, God will bring his blessings. When we don't, that's when problems come in. Because when you remove the head, there is no control. It results in chaos. The movement of feminism has made the claim that women, they can have it all. And really what this does is it tries to pretend that there is actually no role for the man. 
It sidelines, it neutralizes, ultimately it destroys the role of men and fathers. And the result is that young men have no role model. Girls don't have a father figure to look to. I grew up in a part of London where there was major problems with gangs, still is, and it's getting worse. And the number one thing that they found uh, was that there was an absent father, was there was a broken family. June 2008, I think the year is correct, there was something like eight murders within a half mile to a mile radius of where I lived. I knew quite a lot of the victims, I knew a lot of the perpetrators as well, because they were all local people that I'd grown up with, all the same age as me at the time. And what was remarkable was in four, if I'm remembering things correctly here, in four of the cases, it, it, the, the perpetrators all had fathers who were in prison and all of those fathers were in the same prison for the same crime. And now their sons were heading the same direction. Because their sons did not have the role model in the home, they went out to the streets and found an unhealthy role model in the form of the gang leader. So it's having a corrosive effect on society. It's having a corrosive effect on young people today. Tragic consequences that most suicides are of males. It's an untold truth, but most suicides are of males, and that's, I believe, a result of them feeling that they have no purpose. They're told that their natural use as a leader is just toxic masculinity and so on. All of these phrases that get pumped around. What effect do you think that has on the young man that, does, that doesn't have that role model in his life? It messes up the minds of people who know no better. And often when we bring in the, the, the Bible and Jesus, they cannot accept the love of this Father God that we looked at at the first bit there because they're so tarnished by their experience of fathers here on earth. God wants us to fully embrace his love for us, for us all as our perfect heavenly Father. So let's look first at the rejection of the Father's love, and then we'll move on to the acceptance, the opposite. What is rejection? Well, the definition of, uh, there's a couple of definitions here of rejection. The act of refusing to accept, use, or believe someone or something. Refusing to accept, use, or believe someone or something. Or alternatively, the act of not giving someone the love and attention they want and expect. Did you know you were created as an object to worship God? So when we don't accept, when we reject, when we push back God's love and say, I'm okay, I can do it alone, I don't need this God, what we're doing is we're rejecting and not placing God in his rightful place. That's what we're doing. Even every time we put ourselves first rather than God first, every time we put our situation first rather than worshipping and praising Jesus, we're allowing ourselves to actually in a way, reject partly the love of God. But no one likes to be rejected. Hands up who likes rejection. You see, people thought that they were going to say, who doesn't like rejection? I saw a few hands starting to twitch there. <laughs> no hands went up, thank goodness. Um, that would have been interesting. But no, the reality is, we've all been rejected. Let's do a different... Who has ever been rejected in their life? Yeah, two hands up here. Yeah? Two hands up here. We're sitting here on the 17th of November 2024. On the 17th of November 2023, I was sacked for things that were preached from this very pulpit. God's still faithful. I faced rejection, and I faced it down, and God blessed me. And he continues to bless me. But it's not nice. Rejection's not nice. But perhaps the worst form of rejection can be from our parents. Because they're the ones that brought us into life. They're the ones that created us. It cuts to be rejected by the ones who came together to make us, doesn't it? There's something so much deeper than just a, you know, it's not nice for a friend or someone to just sort of reject you, but it's something on a deeper level when your parents reject you in any form. And that rejection in our lives can taint our view of God, which leads us to rejecting him. Not necessarily in full, but potentially in part. Our relationships with our earthly father has a massive impact a lot of the time on how we can have a relationship of whether we even accept or reject a relationship with our heavenly father. Why? Well, because the love of the father on earth is meant to mirror God's love. 
So when that father figure is not a loving figure, when that father figure is absent or abusive, then you're not seeing that love that you should see mirrored. And so you start to think in your mind, maybe God doesn't like me. Maybe it's my fault. I have lost track of the number of people that I have spoken to over the years who are the victims of bad parenting, of absent parents, or of abusive parents. And every single time they reach a point in their life when they are isolated and they think, I am not worth it, because they have been made to feel worthless. So if they feel that they are not worthless, it's very hard to convince them that there is a God that would accept them and would love them unconditionally with an everlasting love. And so our view of God becomes skewed. But God remains the same. You see, the problem is not God, the problem is with us. So what do we do about it? The reality is our earthly father will fail us. Why? Because he's a human. But it means that sometimes people think God will fail me because this person failed me, maybe God will fail me, he'll let me down. But actually the opposite is true. God will never, ever, ever fail us. Why? Psalm 18 and 30. He will never fail us because he's perfect. This God, his way is perfect. You see, we're bringing out scriptures here that are very straightforward because actually we can get wrapped up in theology. We can get wrapped up in big words, but the reality is this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Are you in a place where you need refuge today? Psalm 18 and 30 is your help this morning. He loves us, Jeremiah 31 and 3, with an everlasting love. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And then Psalm 136 and verse 26, and it says, Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Forever. That doesn't mean until a certain point. It means forever and ever and then some more after that. So he's perfect. He loves us with an everlasting love and it goes on forever. He still loves us even when we reject him. How extraordinary is that? And we can think that we are not good enough. We can start to believe a lie that maybe God doesn't want us or we're not good enough for God. The reality is because of sin, we're not good enough. But that's why Jesus came, to make us good enough and give us the opportunity to be free from sin, to be made whole, to come into the presence of Father God. You see, this idea that we're not good enough and it just stops there is a lie from hell because if the devil can convince us that it's true, it keeps us from God. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to keep us from God. So maybe you're sitting there this morning and maybe you're sitting there and saying, well, I've got a father that abused me. So you struggle to embrace the idea of an unconditional love of, of, of the Father God. Maybe your father was simply absent. So you struggle to understand how this Father God could always be present. But there we see in those three scriptures, his love is perfect, his love is everlasting, and he's always there, and it's unconditional. The reality is, God loves you unconditionally. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And that's the promise that you need to embrace. That's the, what you need to hear. So we need today to stop rejecting the Father's love and fully embrace it. Maybe you're in a place where you might say, oh, but you know, I love God and I follow God. But there may be areas of your life that you've not fully surrendered. There may be areas of your life. And the point is that actually the more you seek the love of God, the more you'll find there is more love. And we're not talking here about a warm, fluffy, pink duvet type of love, some kind of fuzzy feeling, some kind of teenage fling. No, we're talking here about a deep, deep love that goes beyond any human understanding. I don't ever really actually want to fully understand the love of God. Because if I have, then I've mastered God, and I don't want to ever master God because I cannot, because I'm operating under the authority of God. There are some things that he has kept from us, hidden from us, that we're not meant to fully understand. Why? Because it's about faith. It's about trusting and believing and knowing that God is faithful and he is exceedingly abundantly able to do all that we ask of him. Praise God. 
God's love is a free gift. It's a free gift to us. And we've got to choose to embrace it. It's a choice. We have to make that choice. We can choose to reject it or we can choose to embrace it. That is the choice. And this passage shows that it's only through Jesus that we are adopted into God's family. We see that as clearly laid out there in verse 5 of chapter 4 where it says to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, an adopted child takes up the full rights as a natural birth child. It's different from fostering. Fostering a child is placed on a temporary basis. When the child is adopted into a family, they become part of that family. Their birth certificate is altered. Their records are changed because the old is gone and there's a part that's closed there. And now this is your parents. This is your home. This is your family. And when we die to sin, when we choose Christ, what happens is the old is gone and that is closed off permanently, completely gone. And even more than that, Jesus uh, wipes the slate clean. He takes the slate, he scrubs it all clean. And when you say, oh, but I'm not worthy, what sin? God replies, what sin? Because Jesus paid the price for all of our sins. Jesus paid the price. You know, Jesus paid the price even for all of the rejection for whatever reason that you may have had over years The law was brought in this passage and earlier on in in chapter 3, we're not going to go deep dive into the law and grace today uh, because we'll be here until, well, probably midday tomorrow. But the law brought in was to set a bar, to set the bar for the standards and to point the way to Jesus. But because of our fallen nature, we could not adhere to that law. And so there was no problem with the law, the problem was with us. But because of our lack of adherence to the law, it kept us from that inheritance of eternal life. It ended up imprisoning us and keeping us from inheritance of eternal life. We see that back in in, in, um, verse 23 of chapter 3. There now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So this sin held us back, it entombed us, It, it, it kept us all in place. Sin is the blockage. It's the blockage that keeps us from any potential of this inheritance, which I might add was there from the beginning for us. But sin, our rebellion against God, our rejection of God, put a block in place that stopped us from being able to have that inheritance. And it was a permanent block. It could not be removed until Jesus came. Jesus made the way. Because he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And this sin, if it's not dealt with, keeps us trapped in bondage. It keeps us slaves to sin. The word says that all have fallen short. We've all sinned, we've all done something wrong. We've all rejected God in some way, shape or form. And it says that, elsewhere it says, the wages, the price to pay for sin is death, that we should die as a result of our sin. But, praise God, that's only one half of that verse because the second half says, but, I love that word, but, because it means the change is coming. It means there's another side. It means there's a flip side. It means that we don't have to be darkened and depressed and hiding in the cupboard. It means that we can come out into the light of day and praise God because it says, but the gift of God, hallelujah, is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You see, as a slave, you have no rights. You have no rights. You are owned. You are property. You have a service to use, to be used for. You do not have any rights. And so when we are slaves to sin, we are literally just operating according to our owner of sin. We are essentially owned by sin. Have you ever been in that place where you may be wrestling, battling with something in your life, an area of sin, an issue in a particular part of your life, and you're just going round and round in this sin forgiveness, sin forgiveness, sin forgiveness cycle? And you're thinking, can I ever get out of this? I know this is not right. But you see, the sin has mastered you. And what you have to do is you have to hand it over to the Lord. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. And some are still living in slavery today. Maybe they reject Jesus fully. Maybe you're sitting there today and maybe you're sitting there and you've never really actually surrendered your life to Jesus. I want to tell you this morning, it's the best decision you can ever make. It doesn't mean that every problem in your life is going to go away. It doesn't mean that life is going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be comfortable. Far from it. But what it does mean is you're going to have a wonderful counselor. You're going to have the mighty God. You're going to have the Prince of Peace right by your side every step of the way, every walk. So that whatever you go through, when a devil tries a coming and knocking at your 
door and saying you're rejected, you're going to say I'm loved. When the devil comes and knocking and says that you don't matter, you're going to say I matter because Jesus was nailed to the cross at Calvary for me. Hallelujah. You know the world today, it talks about liberation. It talks about freedom. It talks about we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Live and live, live. It doesn't matter. Crack on, do what you want, sleep with whoever you want, drink as much as you want, put whatever documents and nonsense into your body. No restrictions, nothing else. Nobody can tell me what to do. Everything's all fine. No. All it does is it makes us a slave to sin. It makes us a slave to sin. Be who you want. Change your gender. When that doesn't work, change it again. Decide that it's different. You know, there's people out there that you've basically got the man that became a woman that's then interested in a man. You know, or the other way around. You know, it's, it, the people are just wrapping themselves up in confusion, and it's so sad. Because really the answer... Is right in front of us. So this rejection of God is, is, is like, it's like being a child. We have the potential for inheritance, but we cannot gain it until that child comes of age. We see that in verse 2 of chapter 4 there. Or in other words, until we gain salvation. There's a picture here of gaining salvation, of gaining entry into and access to that inheritance that's made uh, possible only through the blood of Jesus. Embracing the love of God, accepting Jesus, it's that coming of age. Salvation is growing into adulthood, gaining access to inheritance. And later on in this chapter, we see in verse 8 and 9, it says, uh, it says, Paul was imploring the Galatian church not to return to their slain, not to return to slavery, to choose to fully embrace the gift of the love of the Father and that inheritance that's given through Jesus. And if you have accepted God, why would you go back to your old ways? Why would you go back to the former things? Well, because the devil is constantly knocking and we need to keep ourselves in check, guys. Because a, a follower of Christ that is not pushing forwards is backsliding. And I can tell you, there's plenty of people I can tell you, you see them here every week for months on end, and then suddenly you notice a couple of weeks goes by and they're not there, and then you contact them and you say, oh, well, just been really busy with work. Folks, everyone's busy. Everyone is busy. I was driving on the way here. I'm not telling you who. I was driving on the way here this morning and I see an exercise class happening outside. Someone who I know is a follower of Christ and should be in the house of the Lord. And what are they doing? They're out there with dumbbells in the park. You see, on a cold, damp November morning, on a Sunday, they can get themselves out of bed for that. But you try telling them to get themselves out of bed to come into the house of the Lord to worship God with a fellow believers and the body of Christ. Oh, it's too much. Oh, it's been a heavy week. Oh, I think I'll just take an easy morning. An easy morning lifting dumbbells. I don't know about you. It doesn't sound fun to me. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. You know, the, anyway. But rejection, folks, rejection is part of living in a fallen world. In the natural realm, yes. But it's not part of life in the spiritual realm in heaven. And what are we praying when we pray that Lord's Prayer? We're praying actually, Lord, create your kingdom here on earth as it already is in heaven. So if we're praying that prayer and we're genuinely praying that prayer rather than just chanting out words for chanting out words' sake, then what we're really actually asking is for the, his perfect love, his perfect peace, his perfect completeness and wholeness and stillness. That word shalom actually means to come here to be within us. He wants us to embrace him and to accept him fully. So the acceptance of God is the opposite of the rejection. Acceptance means to agree, the act of agreeing to something such as an offer or an invitation. Well, we see that, don't we? Jesus has made this offer. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Choose God today. Choose God because he has already chosen you by dying for you on the cross. He is the once for all sacrifice. We find that in Hebrews chapter 10. You can read more at your leisure on that front. We cannot have the fullness of God unless we embrace the Father's love, Ephesians 3 and 19. Christ has freed us from this curse of sin by becoming a curse himself. As it says in the words, it says, because cursed is he who hangs on a tree. But we were not meant to be bound in sin. Galatians 5 and 1, it says, For freedom, 
It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's the first half. And we're not talking here about that liberal nonsense that I just mentioned previously. We're talking here about true freedom. Because true freedom is the freedom that sets you free from the things of the world, the fallen nature, the sinful nature. And the second half of that verse says, after saying that it was for freedom that Christ has set us free, no longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. What that means is that you're no longer the property of the devil. That actually I'm a child of God, that I can stand and I can sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And it's more than just a set of words. We can stand there and we can sing, Yahweh, Rapha, he will manifest himself. And when we worship, he will manifest himself. Yes, he will. And it's true. So we can take on and receive this inheritance that shouldn't be ours, but was made ours through the precious blood of Jesus. Something that we don't deserve, we didn't earn it, we can't earn it. It was given to us. It is a gift, freely given to you. We need to stop viewing God through the lens of the experience of our earthly father. We need to accept and embrace the full love, the full forgiveness, and of being made whole by our Father God in heaven. He created us in love. He came for us in love, and he won't let us down. We see in chapter 4 and verse 3 that formerly sin meant that we were enslaved to the way of the world, but Jesus made a better way. Verse 6, that God wants to come and live within us by the power of his Holy Spirit. See, I just find this utterly mind-blowing. This idea that not only do I have a God who loves me unconditionally with a perfect and an everlasting love that I will never be able to actually fathom and understand properly, but yet that he would then come to me and die for me, that he would then not even just stop there, that he would actually then want to come and live within me by the power of his Holy Spirit. How amazing is that, folks? That's something to rejoice about, eh? Something to rejoice about. Praise the Lord. And verse 7 makes it clear that we're no longer a slave, but we're a son. And what is a son? A son is that who inherits rights and property. We have that inheritance of everlasting life. We are, as according to Romans 8 and 17, co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. It's unbelievable, really, but it's true. Accepting the love of Father God means rejecting the lies of the devil. It means that we stop viewing God through the lens of the world and our earthly father and accept him fully for who he actually is. So don't let resentment, don't let resentment today keep you from the fullness of God's love for you. It's time to reject the skewed view of God and accept him for who he is. Let him release his inheritance on you through Jesus. I want to ask you today, what is stopping you? What is holding you back today? Because if you can get over that, then today could be the start of a new life for you. Folks, no one, no experience, nothing that anyone has ever said to you or done to you can undo or override what God has decreed. What God has decreed will happen. Because he is faithful because he is true because he is all powerful so ask yourself today have I truly fully really actually embraced the fullness of this love of Father God perhaps there's issues of unforgiveness in you and you need to forgive your earthly father for 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 absence or how you were treated this could be recent this could be many many years ago but these things Hold us back. We can hold on to these things over a long, long period of time. And sometimes we don't even realize how much it's impacted us. Maybe you need to say sorry to God for rejecting him fully or in part or allowing a skewed view to get in the way of things. Folks, take a fresh view of God as the Father today, embracing his love, accepting his gift of eternal life, that inheritance that we don't deserve but is made possible through Jesus. If the musicians can uh, come up, please. There is the songwriter Matt Redman. Many people are aware of Matt Redman, the great ministry over many years this um, man's had. But perhaps some people don't realize that actually Matt Redman grew up in circumstances not too dissimilar to some of us. His father committed suicide when he was seven. 
He grew up without his father, and his stepfather was abusive. And when he wrote a song way back in the year 2000, he said, I've never really felt fatherless. I lost my dad when I was seven. Things didn't go too good after that with the guy who replaced him. But I've never really felt fatherless. And it talks about it in the song. It talks about God being a father. It's really about how we can sing songs to God. But the song that overwhelms all of them and precedes all of them is his song over us. It's not about us. It's about God and allowing his love to come into our lives. Everyone on earth will fail us at times because we're human, because we're fallen, even unintentionally. We'll make mistakes. <coughs> However good a father you may have had, and I've got a great father, praise God, but he'll fail me at some point. And even if he doesn't, he'll die one day, and then I'll be without him because he's a human. Father God is going to be there forever. He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never let you down. He's always at the end of a prayer. Are you struggling? Cry out to God. You want to worship him? Cry out to God. You want to thank him for his blessings? Cry out to God. He's there. He can hear the prayers of every single person on this earth. I want to ask you a simple question this morning. Are you going to allow yourself to continue to live in slavery or are you going to embrace the inheritance and embrace the love of God fully? Folks, choose to live for God. Choose to be made whole today. Don't wait another day. You might not get another opportunity. Who knows what's going to happen as you walk outside this door. Accept the love of God fully today. He will make you whole. He'll renew you. He'll mend you. He'll fix you. He'll put you back together. He'll heal your heart. He'll restore you to what he even intended for you to be right from the start, even before the fall. I said at the start that God wants to do some business and he wants to heal broken hearts. We want to renounce the spirit of rejection and instead announce the acceptance of Father God's love for you. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Jesus, that because of your death and resurrection, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we can come into your very presence. We thank you that your love for us is everlasting, that it's perfect. We thank you for the promises that you never will leave us, you will never forsake us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you just long to embrace us so much so that you sent Jesus to us. Oh God, I pray, Lord, this morning, even here now, let us examine our hearts. Let us examine ourselves. And if we need to get right with you, then I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to get right with you. To take those practical steps in order to be healed on a spiritual level. Father, we thank you that there is nothing that you are not able to do because you are all-powerful. And you just desire to see us restored to that which you always intended us to be. And Lord, we thank you for your word to us, Lord, and we thank you that you are singing a song over us, a song of love, a song of acceptance. And we thank you, Father, for your wonderful nature. Thank you that we get to call you Abba. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.